Our scripture today comes to us from Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. Hear the word of the Lord. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up and saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there's the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The word of the Lord. Be to God. Let us pray. We ask, O oh God, that as these words were written by the inspiration of your Spirit, so might we hear them in the power of your Spirit, that your word might startle us back into a fuller life than we know. We pray it in the name of the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ. Amen. I am not done thinking or talking about Easter. And given how pivotal this is to the gospel, it's hard to imagine ever being done thinking and talking about Easter. So let's go over it again. Last Friday, Jesus, the one in whom we were hoping, was crucified. And you do not read that story as the disciples experienced it unless you were thinking, last Friday, we were at the end of the story. Last Friday, someone was killed on inner city streets, like Jesus. Last Friday, someone lost a home, or a marriage, or a battle to cancer. Last Friday, so many more people lost their lives in Ukraine. And if we take Good Friday as seriously as those who experienced all of those losses, we had to be thinking this was not the end that we had been hoping for, but at least it was the end. As a pastor, I early on discovered that when people have been going through very difficult times, there is often some measure of relief at just getting to the end of it. But stories that have no ending are unbearable. And then we got 
to last Sunday after the ending to the part of the story where there is only supposed to be some acknowledgments. But Mark continues to tell us about Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome who made their way to the tomb to anoint the dead body of Jesus. But when they got there, they discovered that the stone, the large stone in front of the tomb had been rolled back and Jesus was not inside it. Instead, they encountered a young man in a white robe who said to them, he has been raised, he is not here. Go and tell his disciples, he's gone on ahead of you to Galilee, there you will see him. And then the very next sentence, the very last sentence in the gospel according to Mark was, so they went out and fled the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. The end. What? You call that an ending? Mark, finish the story. Tell us about Mary having this conversation with a guy she thought was just the gardener, but it was the risen Jesus. Or tell us about the two guys on, on the road to Emmaus, and this stranger comes alongside them, and they don't know it, but it's, it's the risen Jesus walking along with them. Or tell us that great story about doubting Thomas getting to put his fingers in the wounds of the risen Jesus. Finish the story like Matthew with the Great Commission or like Luke with the Ascension. Give us an ending. Happy ending, sad ending. We can take it either way, but you've got to finish the story. We are not the first people to be troubled by Mark's refusal to write any more words. Most of our scholars agree that Mark's gospel originally ended with our text today with verse 8. But very early on, longer manuscripts began to appear that had attached other material depicting post-Easter encounters with Jesus like the ones we find in the other Gospels. So from very near the beginning, the church has hated stories that don't end. Does the story end with lament or joy? Does there ever come a time when, when the nations of the earth grow weary of violent empire building or not? Do people actually encounter the risen Jesus and therefore are transformed by that encounter or are they stuck in Good Friday? Mark refuses to answer those questions. He just gives us this young man in a white robe who says he's been risen and he's gone on ahead to Galilee. That's where you'll see him. And then he wraps up by saying, and the women fled the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them. Well, there go the lilies and the bunnies. I mean, Mark wants to leave us wide-eyed and hauling our way out of a cemetery. And that's because, according to Mark, Good Friday is not the frightening part of the story. 
That's just death and loss. We know that ending all too well. That doesn't even scare us anymore. The frightening part is Easter. Because Easter proclaims that death is not the end. And if that's true, then all of our very hard work at securing life and preventing loss is now meaningless. Easter proclaims that the story is open-ended, which is a story of mystery. And to tell you the truth, mystery has always terrified us. But Mark does leave us with a promise. That's pretty much it. The women in this narrative encounter no miracles. There's no great earth-splitting earthquake like there is in Matthew. Mark doesn't even call the angel an angel. He, He just says, a young man wearing white. who makes a promise. That's that's all we have to go on. We're expected to bet our lives on this proclamation. He's gone on ahead of you to Galilee. Galilee. The ordinary place. Where ordinary people faithfully do ordinary things in order to see the risen Jesus. Where we do what Jesus has called us to do all along. Where we feed the hungry and heal the sick and forgive the sinner and choose to love the enemy. For according to the Apostle Paul, we just keep doing whatever is honorable and just and pure and pleasing and commendable. And we do it again and we do it again because that's what we were called to do. Ordinary acts of faithfulness. And there we will see Jesus. To be clear, I'm not saying that we complete the work of Jesus. I believe that the risen and ascended Christ completes his own work through the Holy Spirit. What I am saying is that this gospel calls us to give up trying to write our own story. Give up thinking about the arc of your life or the impact or the difference that you're going to be making. Think instead about what it means to to fulfill the commission, to be the witness, the one who sees the risen Christ at work and who throws your life into participating in this hopeful resurrection work. Back in the ordinary places after Easter, where we return now to do what we know is right with an eye out, for this Savior who is not nearly done. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit.